Well, um, hello everyone. Um, my name is Marcia Shekademian and I'm delighted to be um, chairing um, this webinar on um, the interplay between CVAs and pensions. Um, our speakers today, and you'll be relieved uh, to know that uh, as an insolvency person, I'm going to be saying as little as possible, are uh, David Pollard and Tom Robinson, who between them have literally decades of experience and superlative reputations in this area. Uh, and they're both published authors on insolvency and pensions. So uh, if anyone's to blame for the fact that so very little has been written about uh, CVAs and pensions, uh, you can blame them. Um, but they're making up for it today uh, because they're going to be educating us all on CVAs and how pension debts ought to be treated. Um, so we hope therefore that this talk fills a gap um, as well as, um, uh, if I may modestly say, showcasing Wilberforce's uh, multidisciplinary expertise. Now, we want this session to be uh, interactive. We'll be using polls and we'll also encourage you to use the Q&A button at the bottom of the, your screens. It is the Q&A button, I should stress, not the chat button. And do ask questions throughout the session and we'll try to accommodate as many of those uh, as we can. Um, this is a Zoom webinar, uh, so all of you attendees are automatically muted and your cameras are off. So don't worry about us seeing anything that we shouldn't be seeing or hearing anything that we shouldn't be hearing uh, and having to sort out uh, techie issues of that type. So I'm now going to hand over to David and to Tom. Thank you, Marcia. I'm David Pollard. Uh, you can tell it says there. I'm just a very brief getting to say hello, and Tom's going to start off. But we do have an initial slide uh, which says, which just deals with mainly making the point that there is a very long technical uh, note, lots of footnotes, short, terse, and punchy are words which probably don't apply to it. Uh, but that's going to be available afterwards. Um, and it was just to make the point that CVAs are company voluntary arrangements, not, as I've called them in the past, creditor voluntary arrangements. So I thought we'd just get that off our chest. So, Tom. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, David and I gave a talk on this topic a couple of years ago. And we felt then there were a number of unanswered questions about how CVAs could and couldn't interact with a DV pension scheme. Uh, and at that stage, we'd had some guidance from the PPF but precious little from the courts. Um, and since then, we've had a, a slow moving juggernaut in the form of the Pension Schemes Bill. Uh, we've had quite a number of CBAs proposed, mostly in retail, and some of those have led to court challenges. So we wanted to look again at this area, uh, see where things stand. Um, for those of you watching on a recording, I hope our predictions all turn out to be absolutely correct. Uh, and thank you very much for choosing us rather than all the other YouTube content you could have done. Um, for those of you watching live, can we ask a few questions um, just for our interest? So by way of poll, um, the first one is just to understand your background. Uh, so firstly, do you describe your background as pensions? Uh, secondly, insolvency, C, both, and you can vote while I'm talking. Um, D, neither, uh, E, when does the arbitration webinar start? I'm in the wrong place. Um, uh, and I have actually been to a wedding where the welcome from the vicar to James and Martha's wedding prompted at least one couple to get up and walk out on the basis they were in the wrong place. So um, do submit your results. I don't know whether I have to do the same. Um, and let's see where we're coming from in terms of audience. So, wow, excellent. Almost exactly pensions and insolvency. Uh, next question then, um, have you been involved with a CBA that sought to affect a DB pension scheme? Yes, I have been involved with CBA and sought to affect a DB scheme. <clears throat> no, well, possibly, rather depends. A CV what? So where, where do people stand on that? Um, can we see some results on that one? Okay, good. Excellent. 
Someone is going for the joke. This is Friday afternoon, almost Friday afternoon. I'm allowed to give the joke options. Okay, third one. Um, how worried are you about the criminal offences in the Pension Schemes Act 2021? I'm very worried about the criminal offences. I'm not remotely worried. Uh, they're not enforced yet. And the what? Um, and to explain, because David gave the game away, number three, they're not in force yet. Well, it got royal assent, but the criminal offences need a commencement order and some prosecution guidance from TPR. Um, so without that, they can't get you at all. Although, may I say how lovely it is to have so many people joining from the regulator today. Um, so what's the, um, what's the answer there? Very worried, not remotely, not of course. The what? Excellent. Okay. Um, with that, can I move on to explain who's going to do what during the talk? Um, I'm going to look firstly at pensions as a context and CBAs as a context and, and try and begin to build the relationship between the two. David is then going to look at pensions issues, particularly from the nominee's perspective. Um, and thirdly, the scheme as creditor, what issues arise to do with the scheme and particularly the debt. Uh, then it's back to me for PPF role, PPF eligibility, and finally uh, about challenging CDAs in this context. So in terms of context, brief orientation about CDAs. Um, they're a creature of the 1986 Insolvency Act. They were a new procedure then to allow companies to avoid the formal insolvency process and allow a company to propose a plan to compromise debts, rearrange affairs, then obtain the support of shareholders and creditors to that plan. Uh, and if it's approved, the CBA leaves the company in existence uh, and usually still under the control of its board. Uh, although the arrangement is supervised by an insolvency <laughs> practitioner who's called a, su a supervisor. Uh, in the classic case, the company continues to trade, uses its assets and ongoing profits to pay an agreed proportion of its debts. In fact, the board remains in place is one of the um, features of a CDA that people sometimes get concerned about, uh, particularly actually with the same board in place, who's to stop an insolvency um, situation arising again. Uh, so creature of the 86 Act. Uh, the formalities are a meeting of the company's members uh, and a meeting of company's creditors. And to be approved, a CBA needs the support of 50% of members and 75% in value of creditors who vote. As long as there are 50% of unconnected creditors who also support it. Um, for those of you who know David, you won't be surprised that the question of connection will be featuring later. So there we have it. A plan proposed by a company, by its directors usually, can be a company actually in administration, so proposed by the administrators, needs the support of members and separately creditors. And if it's approved, company remains in existence, and usually carries on trading. Um, as to the content of the plan, flexibility is the key. Um, and some on the webinar may remember the Nortel case with uh, all of the European subsidiaries, where at the end of the whole process, they went into CBAs from administration because it allowed the administrators to pay creditors in other European member states the amount that they would have received under their local laws. And the idea was to prevent lots of insolvencies around the European Union. So we had insolvencies uh, based here, companies in administration, although they were European companies, but the end result, because it needed to be distributions that weren't in accordance with English law, they were in accordance with local law, it was a CBA that was used. So that was just a sort of delivery mechanism. Um, so they can be flexible enough to allow that. The ones in the news at the moment, obviously retail CBAs. So you've got New Look, Debenhams, Pizza Express, and they're focused usually at the moment on the company's liabilities to landlords. Um, so post lockdowns, you have CBAs that are proposing to replace fixed rents with turnover based rents. Uh, and sometimes that turnover is including uh, online sales in the current climate. Um, and the key message that you take from that, I think, is that you can have CVAs that only focus on one particular category of creditors. And as long as you've got 75% consent of all voting creditors, it's perfectly possible to target and compromise one particular group, for example, the landlords. And that's one of the oddities of this structure. The votes of sufficient unaffected creditors can force a compromise on affected ones. 
Um, so at the bottom of the slide, um, three particular types that um, we think are worth considering, particularly in the pensions context, because they will affect when the, whether the scheme is affected or not. The first of those controlled insolvency, that's when you're using a CVA almost as a way of a controlled liquidation. You're selling assets, um, paying creditors from the proceeds, uh, and the rationale is usually there'll be a greater return from creditors in that context compared with administration or liquidation. And you'd probably be drafting the CBA to affect all creditor claims there. Um, so probably the pension scheme too. Secondly, just looking at one group, so the landlord example, um, and as I say, perfectly possible, you can have um, situations where the pension scheme is left wholly unaffected. Um, I've also seen CBAs seeking to compromise the pension debt only and leave everyone else unaffected. Um, and thirdly, supervised trading. Well, this is where you're probably seeking to compromise all claims, but unlike type one, the idea is that it'll last a reasonable period of time. Creditors receive dividends on their claims as a result of that continued trading. And the pension scheme in that context. We've just had, and I think now is, is probably the good, a good time to interpose this question. Yep. A, a good question from Gaurav Srivastava. Um, let me uh, just deal with it. I think it's open. Can you see it? Um, what is the interaction between CVAs and the cross-class cram-down mechanism pursuant to SEGA? Uh, that is a very good question. So SEGA introduces the restructuring plan, um, similar to a scheme of arrangement, and Part 26A of the new company of the Companies Act is where you go to see it, and it allows cross-class cram-down, i.e. the ability to use one class of creditors, as long as people are in the money, so as long as they've got skin in the game, they can be used to cram down another class that dissents. The CBA, uh, and there are a number of differences, but um, the CBA, you still need 75% approval of all creditors who vote, and you've got the connected issue. So is there an interaction? I think we'll see it play out in practice. Some I know are quite, infused by the restructuring plan. We've had Virgin as an example of it. Um, others think that maybe the flexibility of the CBA, um, and obviously that's what is still being used in relation to landlord arrangements at the moment, um, might mean that carries on. So, I mean, there is an interaction, definitely, and you can use cases on schemes, and I'm sure this will be true for restructuring plans as well, to inform what a CBA can do. I want to talk about that a bit later when it comes to proprietary rights. So there is an interaction, um, but I mean, unsurprisingly, they're trying to do, um, they're trying to introduce a different route, different flexibility. Um, so, um, but yes, very good question. The, the cross-class cram down in the restructuring plan is working in a slightly different way in terms of people actually needing to be affected by this. Um, so supervised trading is the third example I want to talk about. Um, that takes me to why it's why it matters that pension schemes are involved. Um, and pretty swiftly, DB pension schemes can be a major consideration um, in a CBA. Firstly, the company might be the employer, so actually sponsoring the scheme. Secondly, might be an associate of an employer, which means that the pensions regulator can look to those companies to support the pension scheme. Uh, and uh, thirdly, you might have situations where the company in the CBA as some form of contractual obligation to an employer. Um, so you can get funding obligations under um, most recently a joint operating agreement, which came before the courts and was construed on its proper construction to mean actually, yes, the other operators in and as an oil development group um, were required to support the pension scheme uh, of the, the main operator. So sticking then with the first of those, the employer, if the company is an employer, well, often it will be a large unsecured creditor. It's got Section 75 debt, which is the name for the uh, deficit in a pension scheme once triggered by an insolvency process, and the commencement of the CBA will count for that. Um, it's got the trustee as a creditor, actually with creditor rights, although in this phase of um, CBA proposals and during the voting, it's the Credit, it's the PPF, the Pension Protection Fund, that actually have the powers to vote. Um, there are other issues because, as I've mentioned, the regulator has powers in this area to look to companies to support a pension scheme 
um, in uh, financial difficulty. And finally, there's a public interest when you start messing around with pension schemes. Um, and therefore, I need an obligatory slide of someone, uh, mainly Frank Field. Um, and I particularly like Philip's quote in the bottom left hand corner uh, about happy balance between work, friends and family. Um, the final poll I want to ask before we move on to David in section two um, is we've talked about the company. Um, we've talked about a company sponsoring a pension scheme. That's the debtor in our context, usually. We've talked about the trustees being the creditor and the PPFM the voting rights. Where do members of a pension scheme fit in all of this? Um, what rights do they have? Um, can I then ask, if we put up the poll, if you have a pension scheme with a corporate trustee, could you put that corporate trustee into a CBA and reduce DB benefits? Now, this is trying to tease out what rights members have. Ordinarily, a DB pension scheme is a trust-based scheme. And here we've got a corporate entity acting as the trustee. It's got duties to husband the assets, to pay benefits to members according to the trust deed and rules. Could you put it into a CVA? Assume you get the relevant supports. And could the CVA reduce the amount members were entitled to? So just as I'm talking, see what, see what you think. And I think you can only vote for one of these. Um, answer, for, answer one, yes, you could. Answer two, no, because you'd be modifying beneficial interests. Um, this is because in 2009, in a scheme of arrangement case um, to do with Lehman Brothers, uh, Lord Newberger looked at the relationship that trust beneficiaries had to assets that were held by Lehman. It's held that in effect, the claims were for property held on bare trust. And he said in a, a scheme of arrangement context, with no reason to think it would be any different for CBAs, um, it's very hard to see how a beneficiary who has a beneficial interest in property held on trust by the company is actually a creditor of that company. So that's the explanation for the, the second option. No, you'd be modifying beneficial interests. You might think that a member of a pension scheme isn't quite like someone asking for property held on bare trust. So it might not be an exact analogy. Maybe it's close enough. Um, the third one, no, because Section 67 of the Pensions Act 1995 prevents modifications to a pension scheme that affect um, subsisting rights, crude rights. Um, now, that's usually looking at amendment powers, but it's broad enough to cover exercising a power conferred on any person to modify the scheme. Does the CBA modify the scheme though? I'm not sure about that. Um, next one, section 91 of the Pensions Act. Are you forfeiting? Well, we know that for these sections, any manner of deprivation or suspension is forbidden. Um, and it has to be an agreement to affect a surrender of pension rights. Uh, and if so, it's unenforceable. Um, is a CBA an agreement? I want to come back to that uh, at the end of the talk. Um, and then the last two, well, yes, you could do it, but the pensions regulator could undo it. And finally, yes, that you'd commit a criminal offence under the new Pension Schemes Act 2021. Um, any thoughts? Um, if you have a thought, then do vote. Um, as I say, what we're looking to tease out is what rights members have. And if we put up the poll, yeah, I would agree. I, I'm... I'm in the 43% camp, certainly, but there may be other reasons as well. I do think that the rights that a member has vis-a-vis -vis the trustee company are not really to be seen as creditor rights. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to hand over to David for sections two and three. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, I'm going to whiz through the very easy but slightly technical stuff that's the interrelation of CBAs and pension schemes uh, and the the trick I'm doing at the beginning certainly this section is looking at the simplest case which is where uh, you have a CBA that's proposed or, or put in place 
in relation to a company and that company is an employer in relation to a DB pension scheme. So we're not, not in a situation that Tom mentioned, uh, at least in this section, where you're a CBA in relation to a company that's associated with an employer. So the scheme may have a, 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 a some sort of creditor status in relation to the, say, a parent company or something like that. But let's look at the simplest case. So we're looking at a, a company which is an employer and it's the only employer in a scheme. This isn't a multi-employer scheme. I'll come back to multi-employer schemes in, in the next section. And the scheme is otherwise PPF eligible. So it could go into the PPF, be protected by the Pension Protection Fund. So that means it's got to fulfill the eligibility requirements that are, that are set out in the legislation. For example, it's a defined benefit. It's UK tax registered and all that sort of stuff. So it's more complex if it's a, a multi-employer scheme. Tom, Tom is controlling the slides on the grounds I keep going wrong with slides. So what are the, what are the issues? Well, the, the nominee, when they report to the court, that's the trigger for a CBA proposal. It's a filing at court. That is defined as an insolvency event under the pensions legislation. So the pensions legislation has a list of various insolvency procedures section 121 and, and a CBA proposal, so filing at court is an insolvency event, and that's unlike a scheme arrangement or the new restructuring plans, which are not insolvency events. Uh, and that insolvency event then triggers notice obligations on the nominee, on the insolvency practitioner who's the nominee for the CBA purposes. So the nominee has to tell if there's a defined benefit, well in fact any sort of pension scheme there, they have to tell the regulator, they have to tell the PPF, and they have to tell the trustees that this is what's going on. And there are two separate notifiable obligations uh, for some strange reason that seem to mirror one another. And then usually uh, that means a PPF assessment period will start uh, because it's a qualifying insolvency event under the, under the legislation. It may not start if there's a multi-employer scheme it's not the sole employer or something like that and they're not all in insolvency come back to that uh, and the the ppf assessment period me, means various things it's while the ppf is looking at the scheme doesn't mean the scheme's gone into the ppf the trustees are still there they're still holding the assets they've still got the obligations but the benefits need to then be reduced to the ppf protected level so if the scheme does eventually transfer to the ppf it's all treated as happening as at the insolvency date, so which will be the relevant date of the filing in a CBA case. So the obligation overriding the scheme is that the benefits actually payable out of the scheme during the assessment period need to be reduced to the PPF protected level. Now, if you've got a scheme, a CBA that say is just dealing with landlords or something like that, you might say, well, we're not going to affect the pension scheme. We're going to keep trading out the other side. Uh, there's going to ultimately be a scheme rescue, so we're never going to get in to the PPF. So is it actually worth reducing the benefits, going to all the hassle of reducing the pensions that have been paid out? And then if we come out, we're going to have to go back and, and pay the benefit, pay the excess benefits again. So in some cases recently, the trustees, I, th I think with the agreement of the PPF and probably the regulator, have agreed not to reduce the benefits pending this being sorted out or not and that seems to have happened in Arcadia there's stuff on the Arcadia website that talks about that from the trustees uh, and that came out of of the of the assessment period because the CBA was approved uh, and so that was a scheme rescue we'll come on to that the PPF then exercises the trustee creditor rights and powers during the assessment period and I'll come come back to that what does that mean as well so there's the assessment period started, the nominees file the notices before, they then need to consider if they can issue three versions of a notice, either a scheme failure notice or a withdrawal notice, which is often called a scheme rescue notice, or a ceasing to act notice, I've ceased to act. Uh, and so there's an obligation on the nominee to think about this and do this uh, as soon as they can. So a scheme rescue is not massively well defined but it's, it's in the PPF entry rules, Regulation 9. It's either the employer has been rescued as a going concern and the employer retains responsibility for meeting the pension liabilities under the scheme and they've not entered into a compromise agreement within Reg 2.2 that prohibits PPF uh, eligibility. Or another person has assumed responsibility for meeting the employer's pension liabilities under the scheme. 
So scheme rescues are actually quite tricky because that, that's all there is in the legislation that sort of says what a scheme rescue is. And they're not, haven't been hugely common, perhaps more common in CBA context. So if we look at these words, Tom, sorry. Uh, what do they actually say? They talk about the employer has been rescued as a going concern. Uh, or another person has assumed responsibility for meeting the employer's pension liabilities under the scheme. Now, none of these terms are actually defined anywhere else in the entry rules or indeed the Act. Well, they are for other purposes. But so what does rescue mean in this context? Uh, must be just the normal meaning of the word. It's actually quite tricky. Has been rescued as a going concern. That, that's, that's David, to interrupt. It's me again. We have a question. It's come up in the chat bar. Can I just remind everyone um, uh, to, to ask questions in the Q&A function rather than the chat bar? Because in the chat bar, I can quite easily miss the questions. But in any event, we have a question from Faith Dixon. And I think it's probably now the right time to ask it. Uh, 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 and this is what uh, she says, when maintaining full benefits in PPF assessment, my understanding is that the PPF will normally require an agreement to keep paying contributions during assessment too. Uh, yes, interesting. I, I'm sure that, that sounds logical. Whether the PPF has power to get an agreement, it's actually contrary, it's, it's actually contrary to the Pensions Act prohibited to pay contributions during an assessment period so whether the PPF feels it can override those provisions I'm not sure but that uh, that sounds logical I don't know is the answer briefly on that this is all extra statutory um, so we're looking at what is a rescue and what is assuming the employer assuming pension liabilities under the scheme. Well, the employer doesn't have any pension liabilities under the scheme, has a, probably has a liability to contribute and fund the scheme, doesn't actually have the pension liabilities, they're the trustees liabilities. So how can you have the, what does that mean in this context? It, it's not as clear as it, as it might be, which is true of most of this legislation. Um, so if there's a rescue notice, if the business was going, always going to continue, so the Arcadia one, for example, I assume, uh, I didn't deal with it, where they uh, uh, had just a landlord CDA and so the business was going to continue going on. You might say, well, OK, could the nominee say, well, look, this CBA, the business is always going to continue. It, the CBA is approved or is it isn't approved. It's not going to be stopped by the CBA. Therefore, can I serve a rescue notice? So actually, we don't have a, 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 a an assessment period at all. The assessment period ends because I've served the rescue notice even before the relevant meeting. Uh, and that would end the PPF assessment and cancel any contingent Section 75 debt. But I think that's unlikely to happen in a CBA timescale unless the, the nominee was really teed up at the time because you've only got 28 days to hold the relevant meeting. So doing all of this serving withdrawal notice within the first 28 days is, is a bit of a stretch probably. And you, actually the PPF then needs to review and confirm the relevant notice before it becomes effective. And you have to actually confirm that a rescue has occurred and give the date of the rescue. So actually, I don't, it's going to be very, very difficult to serve a rescue notice before the scheme actually, uh, uh, the meetings are actually held. Uh, so in practice, you're still going to have an assessment period and still going to have potentially a, a, a contingent section 75 debt. And the same about serving a, a failure notice. Uh, if you serve a failure notice that decontingentizes the section 75 debt, you're fairly clear the business isn't going to continue. Wind, wind up, you could wind up the scheme, which would trigger the section 75 debt anyway. But again, the timescales are a bit tricky to do that. So in practice, you still you're going to have the nominee still out there, either serving a rescue notice or a failure notice. Probably if it's one of these uh, non-affecting CBAs holding the holding off on the rescue notice until the CBA has been approved or not as it goes on. So the DB scheme, whatever that means, is the creditor in, in relation to the CBA. So as Tom said, all the creditors of the company are eligible to admit their claim and to vote in the CBA and they count towards the 75% of things like that, unlike uh, a scheme of arrangement or a restructuring plan where you only have class meetings of the affected classes. So if you're a pension scheme, you're not affected. 
uh, because it only affects landlords or something, or it's trying to only do that, then you don't even have a class meeting, you don't vote. But in the CVA, uh, all the creditors vote and the DB scheme may well be uh, an important uh, and, and large, particularly unsecured creditor. Now, what, what amount does it vote for? Well, if the amount's not as ascertained because it's contingent, for example, or it's future, then it's up to the chair to value it. And it's valued at one pound unless the chair decides to put a higher value on it. Uh, and any creditor can appeal the value given. So in practice, I suspect that chairs look at, or and pension schemes argue, uh, and, and all the PPF argues, well, it should this should be valued at the 75 debt amount or an estimate of what the section 75 debt amount is. They haven't got a certified section 75 debt amount from the actuary. So there's an estimate of the amount being put on. So that then counts towards the 75% or against the 75% in value of the creditor. So it may well be that the pension scheme voting at a large section 75 amount is over 25 percent of the creditors in which case you need to get the pension scheme on side either not to vote at all or to to vote in favor to get over that 75 percent th threshold what happens if the, the pension scheme thinks this is a jolly good idea will vote in favor the ppf or the trustees whoever it is uh, does it then count as a connected or unconnected creditor vote which has this second test that you which is full of double negatives, it's not the case that more than half of the total value of unconnected creditors vote against it. So it's no good getting over 75% if more than half the unconnected creditors voted against. Uh, so question is on that second limb, is the pension scheme vote, either from the PPF or the trustees, is it a vote of an unconnected creditor? Which leads on to the meaning of connected and unconnected in this context which flashes back to the quite tricky definition in the Insolvency Act. So we'll come on to that, but creditors need to vote in good faith. They need to, with the aim of benefiting the creditors as a whole, this is a sort of class vote. So normally when you vote as a creditor or as a shareholder, there probably isn't some sort of overriding good faith or proper purpose test. It's a pro property proprietary, right? But in relation to these schemes, the courts say, schemes and CBAs, you've got to look at whether this has been done in good faith. So for example, someone transferring a debt, they had a debt, but they were a connected person, they transferred the debt to an unconnected person, that unconnected person then voted in favour, this was an IVA case in Capua, and that, that was enough to overrule all the other creditors, and, and the, the, the other creditors complained and said this was an improper use of the, the IVA CBA procedure, and, and the courts agreed that wasn't being done in good faith with the aim of benefiting the creditors as a whole. And you see the same thing in schemes of arrangement, people splitting shareholdings to meet the numbers tests that's there. So if we look at uh, uh, the scheme as a creditor, as I've said, the nominee lodging the report is an insolvency event that triggers the section 75 debt. That's the big debt that's there on a winding up basis for a defined benefit pension scheme. Uh, but that debt is then, and that's trigger that has various triggers, one of which is an insolvency event. But if it's an insolvency event, that debt is contingent on the issue of a scheme failure notice. So I've said in practice, in, in, in a number of CBAs, you won't have had a scheme failure notice issued by the time the meetings are held, or it won't have been issued and, and approved by the PPF. So that, what does that mean to the Section 75 debt? So you've got a notional contingent Section 75 debt, the amount, normally it's the amount certified by the scheme actuary as the pension scheme's net assets less in an estimate of the benefit liabilities, how much you would secure them with an insurer, ignoring any defined contribution assets and liabilities. So in practice, the nominee or chairman is going to need to value the vote based on an estimate of Section 75 debt and perhaps discount it to say, well, look, this is contingent. I'm, I'm not going to give you a full value. I've only got an actuarial estimate anyway. Presumably the scheme would provide that from the actuary. It's, it's not been finally certified, it's contingent because the, the, the insolvency event, the failure notice might not be issued. So it may well be there's a bit of an argument about the level of the debt. The, the creditor is not, as Tom said, he's not the scheme member. The scheme member, or a creditor of anyone in this context, is a creditor of the trustee and the scheme. They're a beneficiary under the trust. It isn't a payment of a benefit by the employer. The creditor is the pension scheme trustee for the employer's funding obligations. 
which are either the Section 75 debt or the Schedule of Contributions debt under, under the pensions legislation, or indeed the obligation under the trust uh, under the trustee and rules to fund the scheme. Uh, and the PPF, as we said, controls scheme debt voting during an assessment period. So it isn't the trustee that votes, it's the PPF that controls the voting. I think it's best seen uh, as that being in the name of the trustees. That isn't an assignment of the debt and the creditor status to the PPF. That would only happen at the end of the assessment period if the scheme went into uh, uh, the PPF ultimately. So that's it, that, that, that control provision is in section 137. It's talking about the rights or powers of the trustees in relation to a debt pass. Uh, and but it's not an assignment I think so my view is it's unlikely that the PPF is the creditor it's instead that's the trustee and Marcia's waving. Me again we have a question from uh, Morgan Bowen how do CVAs um, interact with RAAs? Um, an RAA is uh, a regulated apportionment arrangement which is a way of dealing with section 75 liabilities by an agreement between the trustees and employers uh, in a, a situation where it's thought likely that the scheme is going to and the employer is going to go into an insolvency it requires uh, regulator approval and rather strangely something called a non-objection by the PPF in practice they tend to say we're not going to object we're going to approve it um, and you could use a CBA and have an RAA in that. I think the issue in terms of trying to use a CBA to modify Section 75 debt liabilities and things like that is that how does that interact with the eligibility requirement for CBAs to enter, for, for the scheme ultimately to enter into the PPF if the wheels fall off everything, whereas RAAs are a clear exception from the problem on that. So I think in practice people tend to use, if they can, RAAs rather than CBAs if they're looking to modify pension debts, but this Tom is going to come onto this when we go forward, so you can ask Tom as well. Good, good, so I think the trustees remain the creditor, even though control of the voting is with the PPF. I think that's most likely. There's no, no authority on this. So what does that mean in terms of the creditor as the, uh, uh, as, as in terms of connected creditors and things like that, coming back to this, this 50% rule. So if we go on to the next slide, um, that could impact on the second limb of the voting test. You could try and remove a connection. Say you're worried that the trustee is connected with the CBA company, connected with the employer, because it's a subsidiary of the employer or something like that. Could you desubsidiarize the trustee and stop it being a subsidiary of the employer before the CBA starts? So therefore the trustee isn't connected if you're worried about this second limb of the voting test. Uh, but that runs the risk, I think, of this good faith principle coming in under cap oil. So I, th I think that's uh, not, not necessarily being carried out very much at all, if at all. So it is an issue. So if we go on to what the uh, the connected test is, this is going back to section 249 uh, in the Insolvency Act. So you're connected with the company if you're a director or a SADA director or an associate of such a director or SADA director or an associate of the company and associates got the fairly wide meaning in section 435. So these are insolvency provisions. The trustee is likely to be connected by association if it's owned by the CBA company or it's in the same group, it's under common control then. Pension trustees are generally excluded from association under the trust limb in 4355, but that only applies to the trust limb, doesn't apply to the rest of the association test. So it's not from the voting control set. So I think in practice, a trustee company owned by the CBA company on the same group is going to be a connected company. Uh, one of the trustee companies if one of the trustee company directors is also a director or employee of the CBA company, you probably get in under the extended definition of connected as well. So that's going to apply for this voting test. It also has implications for what goes in the CBA notices because that's got to deal with who is connected or associated, who are connected or associated with creditors. Uh, so it's an issue for what actually goes in the notice to people. So moving on, uh, the scheme's potentially also a preferential creditor. The CBAs can't affect preferential creditors. 
in practice it's not going to be a preferential credit for a large amount uh, un unpaid employee contributions that have been deducted from pay but it is still something needs to be thought about next one uh, multi-employer schemes this is the i whizzed through this very quickly there's a lot more on it in the paper it's much more complex uh the then vice chancellor in the phoenix case said these are of unusual complexity even in the field of pensions legislation so there we go, we have judicial authority. Uh, what happens if you've got the CBA in relation to one employer for an occupational pension scheme, but there are other employers in the occupational pension scheme. So it's a multi-employer scheme and the other employers aren't in an insolvency process, they're solvent. What does that do? Well, you end up in these PPF multi-employer regulations, uh, which have effect to modify the standard regulations in a way that's massively complicated. Uh, so it becomes a question of could it trigger a partial scheme winding up because one of the employers uh, uh, is in the insolvency. Uh, if it doesn't, then it may not trigger a PPF assessment period for the scheme because the um, that's only triggered if all the employers in a non-partial winding up scheme go into, go into uh, winding up. That may mean that the Section 75 debt that is triggered by the winding up or the insolvency of one employer, but that remains contingent because it, it's been triggered by the, the CDA proposal, but only for that company. There hasn't been a PPF assessment period, so there's none of these notices. So this is in the paper. Let's look at this just in a, a slight amount of more detail. Uh, I'll run through this very quickly. You, you, the multi-employer regulations divide schemes into part five schemes. We've got a requirement for a partial winding up part six schemes where there's no provision for a partial winding up part seven schemes an option for a partial winding up so very quickly uh, a partial winding up is where you wind up part of the scheme if you've got no partial winding up rule uh, and i've always found partial winding up rules complete nightmare and i think if you have no partial winding up rule your ppf levy is lower uh, then there's no assessment period if only one employer has gone in because that's not a qualifying insolvency event so that means the PPF doesn't take control of the P scheme votes uh, as, as a creditor and the, the nominee still has to serve the notices on the PPF, but you've got no, you, it's a contingent debt, it's contingent on a scheme failure notice, but you can't have a scheme failure notice because you're not in a PPF assessment period. So it's still very contingent. So how is it, the debt may never become non-contingent, how does the nominee value it? So moving on to a part five scheme, or part seven there, you have got a requirement or option to segregate. Partial winding up is very tricky. You have to segregate assets and liabilities. I have to say, I've never done one. Uh, they are, because they're just to be avoided at all costs. The, the wording on how you segregate the assets and liabilities it varies from scheme to scheme and is incredibly complicated how it actually works in relation to section 75 debts and orphan liabilities and that sort of thing. So uh, avoid at all costs is the general rule unless you can so that that's multi-employer schemes so i think over to tom no you've I've got, got a, I've got a hand i've got a hand in here good you don't get away that lightly uh -huh. um it looks like an exam question but then what would i know this is francesca bailey would adding an additional employer uh, that would not become insolvent as part of the cva to a sole employer scheme before the cva takes place in order to avoid a PPF assessment period, fall foul of the good faith rules. See, that's the issue on CBOs is you end up with cunning plans all over the place. I don't think it's in the good faith rules because the good faith rules are all to do with the voting at the CBA. They're not about, uh, you know, so if you do something that affects the voting, you could say that that or, or modifies the voting. I think if you, if you modify it to move to a sole employer scheme, if, uh, away from a sole employer scheme before the CVA takes place, then you, uh, I mean, there are all sorts of issues about will the regulator look at this for uh, contribution notice issues floating around? Would you find another employer? There, there are ways of doing this involving suicide codes and, and, and things like that as, as ways of triggering, for example, mainly in connection with RAAs and SAAs uh, and things like that. Um, so I don't think it would fall foul of necessarily the good faith rules, but there'd be lots of other things floating around. And uh, what I haven't mentioned in all of this, and we'll, we'll try and deal with at the end, is, is all these new criminal offences and 
and super financial penalty stuff when it comes into force under the uh, 2021 Act uh, is doing any of this like voting on a CBA, proposing a CBA, potentially criminal or potentially giving the regulator power to issue these new super penalties or something like that. I think the answer is potentially it is, but do you have a reasonable excuse? Is a CVA just using an insolvency process a reasonable excuse? I think lots of people will argue, yes, it must be, uh, but it's a jury question for the jury on those things. So we'll come back to that at the end, I think. Uh, thanks, David. So I'm gonna look at um, PPF roles in a CVA. Um, as David said, the commencement of CBA process starts an assessment period uh, and the PPF has voting rights, section 137. Um, to understand the PPF, we need to go back a bit um, to uh, about 2002, 2003. Um, and a company called Allied Steel and Wire, which went into an insolvency process. And at that stage, nothing like the, the PPF, nothing like a, a sort of statutory fund that might um, make good a deficit on people's pensions, um, the steel workers ended up losing uh, very large portions of their pension because their employer went bust. And they didn't sit back and do nothing. Uh, they went to Bournemouth for the Labour Party conference and they took off all their clothes and stood on the beach and held a sign up saying, strip bare of our pensions. And the Labour government said, my God, naked steel workers, we've got to do something. So they started, uh, they legislated for um, the Pension Protection Fund which is usually described as a lifeboat. Um, and it's a lifeboat created by statute, which is launched when an employer uh, goes bust or um, sticking with the analogy goes under, go under. Uh, and the lifeboat sails out, meets the pension scheme members. If the scheme is sufficiently resourced, so this is why there's an assessment period, it sort of assesses whether the scheme is sufficiently resourced on its own to carry on. And the lifeboat turns around and says, fine, you've got your own lifeboat. Um, but if not, then it accepts the members into the PPF and it accepts the assets from the scheme as well. Um, and it's funded by levies on other defined benefit pension schemes, as well as using the assets it receives from uh, those where the employers went bust. Uh, the level of levy depends in part on how shaky the employer is. So unsurprisingly, you can see from all that, it operates in the world of insolvent or near insolvent employers. Um, and it's well resourced and it's in, well informed. And it has the scheme's vote during the assessment period, which is when the company and the insolvency practitioners advising the company are looking to creditors saying, how are you gonna vote on this particular CBA? So um, it plays a pretty critical role in general. Uh, and that's not just because of the size of the debt, although obviously that's a very important part of it. Um, the concerns of the PPF are not only obtaining the best deal possible from the CBA for that particular pension scheme, but also setting a precedent um, the next CBA that comes along and tries to prejudice the scheme. So one needs to have that in mind when you look at the guidance note. Now the guidance note that is in force at the moment came out in December 2018. I'm going to whistle through it, um, just signposting that it treats two situations differently. Um, and the two situations David mentioned, one are scheme rescue and one um, not scheme rescue, no prospect of scheme rescue. Uh, if there's no prospect of a scheme rescue, the scheme is going to end up in the, C in the PPF anyway, then it looks for a significantly better return than from an admin or a liquidation. Uh, it looks for anti-embarrassment equity, it looks for 33% of the shares. That's on the basis that the existing shareholders remain involved, that's sort of the basis for CBA anyway. Um, it looks to see the pension scheme treated equitably as against other creditors, uh, and it wants all costs um, paid by the company. If there is to be a scheme rescue, the guidance note starts by saying that in any event, the scheme must, uh, the CBA must mean the employer covenant's weaker. Now, employer covenant, um, there are books and whole industries uh, devoted to working out what the employer covenant means. I'm not going to try and trespass on that. Um, the sort of perhaps the working definition for today is an employer covenant is the ability of an employer to support the scheme financially, coupled with the extent of its obligation to do so. So ability to support and is it actually obliged to use that to support the scheme. So the employer covenant, says the PPF, inevitably affected by a CBA. Well, 
yes, I can see that. But I mean, surely the point of a CBA is to actually improve the covenant, remove some of the issues that are bedeviling this company and allow it to continue. Uh, but it's certainly right that a CBA is an indication of financial weakness. And the PPF's first concern is there'll be a later insolvency in any event. So um, one issue, and the second in the bullet point there, addressing a single issue, says the PPF, not likely to provide an overall solution for the employer. It is rare that there's only one reason why a company ends up in financial difficulties. And so the CBA um, comes across the PPF's desk and they consider the risk that it prevent, presents to the PPF down the track. Is there gonna be a staving off temporarily of insolvency followed by a later bust at the end? And that is important, not only because in the meantime, the pension deficit might grow, but also because if the PPF lets things run on, the liability for the PPF is likely to be higher because when a scheme enters the PPF, pensioners are promised 100% of their pensions. But those who haven't yet retired don't get 100%. There are restrictions that come in. And the idea is if you haven't yet retired, you've got some working life, you can make good this damage or make good some of it. Whereas if you're a pensioner, you've planned on the basis of the pension you're going to receive, so you, you get 100%. So you can see that over time, as more and more members reach retirement age, they will be entitled to 100%. So if the scheme goes into the PPF five years later, there'll be another tranche of members entitled to 100%, the bill for the PPF is therefore higher. And that's called PPF drift. And the PPF are concerned about that, which is the third bullet point here. Uh, and finally, it looks at the risk of the proposal to the PPF, not just um, scheme members. There are a list of very sensible factors that the PPF recommend we all consider. Um, and we'll ask whether the CBA deals with these, among other things, is, is there a viable restructuring plan? Have you looked at bank financing? I don't need to go through them in detail. Um, but the other area I wanted to look at for the PPF is um, eligibility. Um, and I mentioned the lifeboat, which goes out, assesses whether a scheme will be taken into the PPF. And David mentioned this too. Certain schemes are eligible for PPF entry. Um, one of the reasons why a scheme will not be eligible is if it enters into a legally enforceable agreement, the words in red here, the effect of which is to reduce the amount of any debt due to the scheme. Um, now, there's a live issue, I think, as to whether a CVA might constitute an agreement, the effect of which reduces the amount of the Section 75 debt that's due. And David, when he was answering Morgan's question about RAAs, made this point. RAAs, we know, are an exception to this Regulation 2.2 uh, rule in the PPF entry rules. So RAAs, and my only addition to Morgan's question in terms of the difference between the two, CBAs have a lot more stigma, it seems to me, than an RAA. An RAA is seen in the market as very much just a neat way of dealing with a pension problem. It needs the approval of the regulator. There's another big difference between the two. But you avoid the stigma with trade creditors, suppliers, and so on if you go down the RAA route. Um, but is a CBA a legally enforceable agreement? As I say, it's a live issue. Um, the, uh, the way in which some of the cases describe CBAs is as a statutory contract and working as a contract imposed by statute between company and creditors. We know that you can have a contract that modifies the Section 75 debt. That's a case called Bradstock from 2002. Can you put the two together and say, well, hang on a second, a CVA that modifies a debt is actually in breach of this restriction. It's a legally enforceable agreement. Now, I think the better answer is probably no, because for the purposes of the PPF entry rules, when it refers to an agreement, it doesn't mean a statutory construct. And there have been some recent cases looking at this, they're in the bottom of the slide. In a nutshell, they say that, well, you might call it an agreement in order to understand what's going on between company and creditors. But actually, when you try and apply that to particularly statu statu particular statutory contexts, you may well find it's not an agreement at all. And those statutory contexts include the Employment Rights Act in a case called Britannia Heat Transfer, 
rules against penalties, uh, SHB realizations as part of the BHS case, and lastly, Contract Rights of Third Parties Act, uh, last year, um, a decision called Rhino Enterprises. So CDAs, yes, they may be called statutory contracts. You hear them referred to as agreements, um, but I think you need to dig into, well, is it an agreement for the particular context you're looking at? And here, I suspect the answer is no. Um, the last point, and I'm gonna do just a minute on this, is to say, um, we've said through the talk ways in which you could challenge CDAs to bring those together you can firstly appeal against a chair's decision as to how much he's going to allow a creditor to prove for. Uh, and that's under the insolvency rules. It's a fresh hearing. I've got one at the moment where initially the claim was allowed on the basis of a letter. And we've now got witness statements, bank statements, um, loan agreements. The whole thing looks so different from when it came before the chair of the meeting. You can separately challenge on the basis that it's unfairly prejudicial to the interests of, for example, the creditors, or there's a material irregularity in the way the voting has happened. Those are under section six. Um, there are strict time limits for both of those routes, but the last route that's gaining a bit more popularity at the moment is to argue that actually the CDA is trying to do something that a CDA should not be doing at all. And the example we've had at the moment is a CDA trying to interfere with property rights, um, forcing surrenders of, um, of property, for example. The big advantage there is there's no time limit on the challenge because you're really saying this CBA was never an arrangement for the purposes of the Insolvency Act at all. And the last bullet point query is whether you could use, the, whether the regulator could use its moral hazard powers to undo a CBA. Um, and on that and on the new Pension Schemes Act, I'm going to hand over to David for the last slide. Right. Well, we're going to be saying a lot about the Pension Schemes Act because it, it is uh, a very big, I think, shift. So we're criminalising Parliament and the current government. I always use the word current before government because they keep moving, have decided uh, in their wisdom that, uh, and this has taken rather a long time, so a royal assent yesterday, uh, but not yet in force, decided to... to put in place some very wide ranging offences. They're pretty vague. Um, they're very difficult to construe and understand. And there are new uh, super civil penalties. They're called financial penalties, which the regulator has power to. Now this is all arguably, well, the criminal stuff's definitely criminal. Could it apply if you agree to a CVA? Well, you're doing thing, one of the offences is doing something that affects a debt that's due under section 75. Uh, what is a debt that's due under section 75? The legislation doesn't explain. Actually it does on the new contribution notice power, but it doesn't in relation to the criminal stuff, slightly weirdly, um, uh, which is true of all of this. So it can apply to any person who's a party to a relevant act, uh, which, which is a contribution notice from financial support direction stuff. The new criminal stuff uh, can apply to anybody. Anybody who does anything that impacts on a section 75 debt or impacts on benefits can be guilty of a criminal offence. Uh, prosecution only by the agreement of uh, the regulator or the DPP or the Secretary of State. Um, actually, if you think about some of this, some of the actions that the regulator will take could have an impact on employers and could have an impact on section 75 debts. So arguably, the regulator might have an issue about committing a, a criminal offence. So there you go. It sort of applies to everybody. There's some carve outs for insolvency practitioners, but they're not full. They don't cover everything an insolvency practitioner does. They don't seem necessarily to cover secondary offences by insolvency practitioners uh, and that sort of thing. There was an, an ILA and the City of London Law Society letter to the DWP uh, back in January uh, last year talking about all this. So. Uh, having said this, all these points about how wide, how vague the coverage were, me were points made to government, were made to Parliament during the passing of the Act, uh, and Parliament and the government decided to go ahead without that. So these are points that are going to be there. There was a deliberate decision by Parliament to make this very wide. I quite like the MP who stood up and said, would a, a trade union uh, be potentially acting criminally if it negotiated a pay rise? with an employer in relation to a pension scheme, unless it could show a reasonable excuse. 
And the minister said, yes. So uh, this is quite wide. It depends on reasonable excuse for the criminal stuff. Can you show, it would be up to the prosecutor to show that you had, the individual had no reasonable excuse or company. Uh, and that's a jury question. It's a question of fact for the jury. Does the jury think you've got a reasonable excuse or we had no reasonable excuse? Onus of proof probably on the prosecutor beyond all reasonable doubt, beyond reasonable doubt, whatever the criminal test is. Civil penalties, uh, unclear what the onus of proof is on that, although I think strongly arguable that certainly the new super financial penalties look pretty criminal to me. They're called financial penalties, they're not called civil penalties. Okay, um, so therefore it, it, it's a bit watch this space because there's going to be an issue of how the regulator or the prosecutors act, are they going to investigate? Are they going to prosecute and are they going to win on a prosecution? So it's three levels of risk. So I could go on for a lot longer on this. Uh, well, thank you, David. Thank you, Tom. Um, we've had three or four more questions in, in the last uh, 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, and obviously we don't have, have time for all of those. So um, I'm going to choose just one of those questions which I naively think may prompt either a yes or no answer or a very short answer, bearing in mind that there's no such thing as a yes or no answer in the law, otherwise why would God have invented lawyers? But anyway, here we have the question. It's from Tim Cox. Uh, where the debt in a multi-employer scheme is contingent and the scheme failure notice is never issued, would the CVA employer stay on the hook for any future debt on scheme winding up? Well, there's a, there's a short answer and a long answer. Give us the short answer. Uh, I, 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 I've debated this with Tim before. I, I, I think you probably fall within one of the, it's a question of how the employer, does it remain as an employer? because it's, it's uh, as an informer, potentially as a former employer, uh, for scheme purposes, does it fall within the, you're not a former employer, there's a whole raft of exceptions for PPF and Section 75 debt purposes, one of which is you didn't have the debt claimed and you didn't manage to pay it, because, so you didn't pay it and things like that. So this, this sort of potential of remaining an employer and then having another Section 75 debt down the track I, I suspect that doesn't fit very cleverly around these contingent debts, but my feeling is, if push came to shove, that probably it, it, it's more likely than not it's going to be not an employer still under those provisions, but they are fiendishly complicated and there is no case law, not much case law, uh, on it. So that's, that's the best I can do, I think. Oh, nice and short. Well done, David. Um, thank you very much, all of you, all 300 of you, in fact, for uh, attending our webinar today. And we, we really hope you found it useful. Certainly not being a pensions person myself, um, I learned a lot from today's session. So um, please don't be shy and leave us your uh, feedback uh, on the post-webinar questionnaire. Uh, that will appear in your browser after this session. Um, for those of you um, who um, can't wait to have some more, um, this recording will be available on our YouTube channel um, and just type Wilberforce Chambers uh, into the search button in YouTube and you'll get all of our um, webinars and web chats. And there are other pensions and insolvency uh, webinars and web chats on our channel uh, for uh, you uh, to enjoy. Um, so thank you very much again for uh, coming. And um, hopefully we will see you in inverted commas soon. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Thank you everyone for coming. Thanks a lot. Thank you for the questions as well. Yes.